Hey guys, it's Gianni here. Just a quick disclaimer before we start this episode. Hear me out. Mattia decided to dress up as Joel from The Last of Us. If you know, you know. And she fully committed to the character. So her voice is very manly for the first few minutes. But I promise it's not like that for the rest of the episode. So just bear with us. And I hope you enjoy this. Boo! Boo! Shit, I messed up. Are you scared yet? You're about to be scared. Happy Halloween! Hear us out! Don't look under your bed. (laughs) This is about to be a really scary episode. You about to pee yourself. I did when I was (laughs) (laughs) God. (laughs) Hello and welcome to Hear Me Out Podcast. My name's Joel. My name is Rebecca. (laughs) And today... We have an extra spooky episode <laughs> for you. <laughs> oh, I'm so scared. You may have known me from The Last of Us. Oh. It's a TV show. Okay. But okay. before, it's a TV show about my life. Okay. So I'm in it. And it's about me. I was getting Amish gangster. Um, well. <laughs> um... Yeah, so during the show, you'll see I have to attack zombies and stuff and save the world. Well, I hurt myself pretty bad doing oh, that, yeah. so I have to wear a neck brace. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as you can see on the show, basically homeless, no money. I'm doing pretty well for myself. Yeah, you're doing after good. The show. Damn, you got yourself a hat. Yeah, yeah. Because I ride horses and stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. Zombie horses. Oh, I'm sorry. It's probably inappropriate of me to be wearing it in front of a beautiful lady oh, like yourself. It's okay. You just slap that back on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Today I'm joined with. Miss Beautiful Rebecca. Yeah. Are you single? I forgot to ask. Uh, no. I'm not, unfortunately. You ain't got a ring. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Everyone's single till you say I that's do. That's true. And I live by that. Mm-hmm. It's the only way. I just know whoever you're with can't protect you the way I can. I killed. From the zombies. I've killed before. Oh. Many. Zombies. Many people, (laughs) zombies, anyone that gets in my way. Ever since the apocalypse, I haven't done much killing, but I got it in me. You haven't killed much since the apocalypse. No, no, but I got it in me. All right. Today, we are reading some real and fictional, I think all all mine are real, horror Halloween stories. We suggest you don't listen to these alone, Mm. because it's scary. Yep. All right, do you want to go first? <laughs> oh, what the? What is ha- <coughs> Uh-oh. Oh, my my voice. Oh. I have a cold right oh, now. Oh, there it goes. And so my voice sometimes, like, when I get a cold, you I sound, sound very, very, very deep. Sick. Oh. Oh. My voice gets deeper because I, I have, like, oh. a uh, lot of nasal issues. Okay. Because of the what's... apocalypse. That's what's going on. Yeah. The apocalypse, you know, I was... I, I was around so many fumes that mm. I just, my immune system doesn't work the same anymore. <laughs> so many zombie fumes. All right, let's just dive right in. All right. To this scary, spooky episode and happy Halloween to Happy everyone. Halloween. This is a story called Stranger Under the Bed. Oh, shit. I gotta look under the bed really quick. <laughs> it's it's okay. from... Myra, Myra, nothing under our bed, go on. Okay, I'm scared. (laughs) I am 22 and this incident happened a year and a half ago. I had just moved into my first apartment and was in the process of moving in. The door that led into my apartment locked itself automatically when you, you close it. So I was going to the entrance of the apartment complex to get my mail while talking on the phone with my boyfriend. I returned to my apartment and sat on the bed while opening the mail while using the phone. I dropped the phone on the floor and it landed under the bed. So I had to lie on the floor and stretch for it. I saw something that caught my eye. 
There was someone under my bed. My eyes widened and I choked up the urge to scream. The person under my bed was lying still with his back towards me and his head to his chest. So I couldn't see his face and he didn't see me trying to be rational while so many thoughts rushed through my head. I picked up the phone and said, sorry, I dropped my phone. I'm just going to take a shower and call you back. The bathroom is right by the bed. So I hastily walked in, quietly locked the door, turned the shower on, jumped out of my window, my apartment's on the first floor, and called the police. They told me to wait nearby but go to across the street and see if anyone comes to the door to the apartment complex. This was during summer and it was still light out. I played myself I placed myself across the street, hiding behind a car while watching my open bathroom window and the entry door. I called my boyfriend and he came to me just before the police. I gave them my keys and they went inside. Only moments later, two cops came out holding a thin, tired looking man. His eyes looked crazy, but he didn't try to run away. The policeman that had stood beside me and confronted me while the police searched through my house told me that the man stood outside Inside my bathroom door with one of my kitchen knives waiting for me to come out. This man had somehow crept in my entry door while I was getting my mail and did and hid under the bed. The man that was trying to hurt me turned out to be a homeless person and was playing placed in a mental hospital. My boyfriend moved in with me the very next day. Oh my god. That is so creepy. So he was literally just gonna kill her to kill her? Like he was yeah, just mentally unstable? I guess so. That's the scariest part about like serial killers is like you don't even have to do something bad like you can be the nicest person ever Mm -hmm. and then a random person just kills you because they want to kill someone and you're like an easy target or something i guess moral of the story run out of the window don't try to come back out because he will be there with a knife my god that's so bad could you imagine just like dropping your phone looking under your bed seeing a person under there facing away from you i honestly think i would do the same thing as her like i am i well that's the best thing to do act like you didn't see him yeah i'm a very like okay there's no point in freaking out right now because they're going to get razzled to just kind of be like like if someone broke into my house i think i would literally be like oh my gosh i'm literally in the wrong house right now and leave and be like that was so weird i'm so sorry sir and like like they like literally be so dumb that they're like wait what like they're so like, confused what just happened that they don't even know what to do they don't know that you know that they're a robber exactly i would have done the same damn thing she did i would have pretended like i didn't see him i also probably would have been like sorry i dropped my phone i'm gonna go sharpen my i'm gonna go load up my gun and sharpen my knives before i go to bed uh, and then leave well then they would want to kill you more because well, you're a threat might- but i have a gun well, they think at least during the apocalypse, we'd, we'd find people everywhere. Here's you know? the thing. Would they believe if you were walked into a house, you had your keys, garage opens, you know, all that. You walk in and you're like, oh my God, this isn't my house. <laughs> my, no, exactly. And that's why we are going to live. That's why I survived the apocalypse. And that's why we're going to live forever because okay. that's what we think. Oh, I need to shave so bad. This is itching shave it off joel the weirdest date of my life trigger warning can i just say something really quick i can't stand when people say trigger warning but don't tell you what they're about to trigger okay because people have triggers for different things some people have triggers of like sa or you know just like different things trigger people Mm -hmm. so they don't say hey this is an sa trigger warning or this is a self-harm trigger warning warning they just say trigger warning like, how am I supposed to know if this is about to trigger me, you know? So, are you are you specifying a trigger? No. Oh, okay. I'm just, it says trigger it warning, and it thought. doesn't tell me which one. Just a thought. We'd like to know the trigger. I think the trigger, the trigger is, because I read the story, the trigger is death. Okay. <laughs> Valid trigger for pretty much everybody. The weirdest date of my life. I don't know what to do about my new girlfriend, Corinna. Something really, really bad has happened, and I'm not even sure what it was exactly. Like, I haven't fully processed it yet. This is fucking crazy, but I don't know who else to talk to about it. Here it is. My girlfriend Corinna asked me to attend her dad's execution with her mom. I swear I'm not making that up. She asked me two weeks ago if I would be willing to go with her and her mom to the federal prison just a few hours away from her to see her incarcerated dad. She wanted me there for emotional support while the state carried out his execution for a crime of passion that he committed almost two decades ago. Honestly, what would I have said or done in this scenario? 
I'm absolutely in love with Corinna. So I couldn't think of anything other than saying yes. I mean, I didn't even know her dad was on death row. All I knew was when Corinna and I met, dad wasn't around when she was growing up and that he was in prison. I just wanted to be a good boyfriend. The day of the execution, I was so nervous. I got up early and drove to her house where she still lived with her mom. They were both dressed up sim in similar dresses. Her mom's dress was almost slightly inappropriate for such a solemn event. It was so weird. We got to the prison shortly before noon. I thought they were going to let the family say goodbye or something before the dad's execution was carried out. Instead, when we arrived at the prison, they almost rushed us into some waiting area that had some other people in there that said they would be witnesses. There was a priest, I think a few journalists, and then some other family members, most of them I didn't recognize. At first, a stern-looking prison official did not want to let me accompany my girlfriend inside. They said it was for only approved attendees and immediate family, but unfortunately, somehow my girlfriend convinced them to let me accompany them inside to witness everything. Never in my life had I ever seen someone die before. I was so nervous about what I was about to witness that I thought I would be sick. Several times I could feel my mouth to start fill up with saliva, like it did whenever I was about to throw up, but I was able to suppress the feeling. Eventually, a few prison officials escorted everyone in the waiting area to another dark room that had a large window looking into another room that had a medical-looking table with some straps attached to it. Corinna's dad wasn't there yet. Corinna's mom was quietly crying, and my girlfriend was oddly quiet. I remember I couldn't believe how she and her mom looked alike in that moment. My girlfriend didn't look at me, but just kept staring ahead in anticipation of when they would bring him out. Eventually, an official came out and told us that the prisoner would be brought out shortly. When her dad walked into the room, I saw the guy for the first time. He was tall and thin and looked oddly serene for someone who was about to die. He smiled at the guards who smiled back at him. He greeted each of them warmly and they seemed to respond kindly to him. Then he took a deep breath and smiled again. Then he looked into the window separating the execution room and the witnesses. His eyes immediately went to Corinna's mom, Corinna, and me. His smile suddenly dropped at that point. Then he kind of winced slightly as his eyes stayed focused on mine. My heart was beating a million miles a minute. I think I even fucking waved slightly at him out of nervousness. I was so scared. I was about to witness someone die that I didn't know and I didn't know how to act. The priest, dressed in all black, was escorted into the room to speak to her dad while the guards begrudgingly strapped him to the table. Her dad seemed well-liked by the prison staff. Finally, the warden asked whether her dad had any last words. Her dad then looked directly at me again, I mean directly into my eyes and just stared at me, unblinking. It scared the hell out of me, so much that I looked away and then to Corinna who ignored me and just continued to look into the room along with everybody else. I was gripping her hand tightly, but I didn't say anything. I turned my gaze back into the room with her dad and he was still just fucking staring at me. I almost wanted to say, what is it? Because of how awkward it was but he suddenly shook his head and said, I don't think so. The warden then said, Jim, are you absolutely sure that you don't have any last words? Your family is all here for you. Please, this is your last chance, he said sympathetically. He shook his head and he didn't say anything. The warden then read some kind of death sentence or certificate or something, and they started to inject him with the medication. I assume it was the lethal injection they used. As soon as he di did this, though, he seemed to have a change of heart and tried to jump up and speak. Damn it, I'm so sorry. Boy, you need to run. She is just like her mother, he shouted before being pushed back down. She's the same as her mother, he shouted. I looked over at Corinna and she had this look of hatred or disgust watching this. Her mo mom's expression scared the shit out of me. Despite the tears on her cheeks, her mouth was slightly upturned in a sort of suppressed-looking smile or sneer. He tried to speak again within the first minute, but it didn't last long. It sounded like he once said, It suck, or just suck, then you buy. He fell asleep, then seemed to struggle slightly with his breathing, then he was pronounced dead. It took about 15 min minutes in total. It was very uncomfortable to watch. Afterwards, I took Corinna and her mom home. It was a quiet ride the whole drive. Corinna did something odd when we made it back. She tried to initiate sex with me. Obviously, I couldn't do that, but the next morning she tried again. Every day since then, we've been having a lot of sex, but I'm feeling really weird about it, despite how into Corinna I am. Even in my dreams, we're having sex. I wake up exhausted and not refreshed at all. At this point, I'm kind of worried about everything. I'm exhausted and weak, and I feel like I might have some kind of trauma from what I saw. Corinna, though, couldn't be happier. 
Her mood and energy are super high. What does this mean? Should I talk to someone about this? So that's the end of the story, but what everyone's saying in the comments is she's a succubus. They like leech onto someone and have sex with them and they're really hot. And then that gives them energy and that like feeds them and they like drain you. I'm wondering how well he knows his daughter, first of all, if he's been in prison his whole life. Also, those were his chosen last words. Maybe it's true. Right? No, right? Like if he chose to say that, I mean, he could be crazy, but... Okay, a succubus is understood as a Lilian demon in a female form or supernatural entity that appears in dreams to seduce men, usually through sexual activity. Oh, that's weird. How to fight a succubus. Make them fall in love with you and to kill them after intercourse. I hope people don't do that. If you're trying to kill one, you will have to make sure that the succubus does not touch you so the seductive spell cannot affect you. What? You're supposed to kill them after intercourse, but you can't let them touch you. Imagine being insane and thinking your girlfriend, because she's so hot and, like, so sexual, is a succubus, and then you kill them after sex. That's what I'm saying. Don't do that. She probably got some other problems. Oh, my God. That's actually a really scary thing about. Could be having dreams about them having sex because he thinks it's so weird that she wouldn't have sex after her dad just got murdered. Which that story, I was like, like the succubus thing. I'm like, oh my god. Also, state executions, disgusting. I wonder what his crime of passion was. I'm if it has something to do with the mother. I bet it does, cause it's they said two decades ago. That's twenty years ago. Bro is like, like murder, rape. It's bad. So, death row is like bad. She, I think the mother got him in jail somehow. If they're succubuses set him up yeah i definitely think you can't i if i can't have you nobody will exactly, exactly. crime of passion because they were definitely together when it happened because his daughter and him they're they seem like they're older and it was two decades ago that it happened so 20 years yeah. ago well that's what i'm saying he was in jail her whole childhood like how well does he know her probably not well at all but, but he chose to say it for his last word yeah. he probably just knew that she was yeah but he, it's mean if he if he doesn't actually know you don't have to be like your mother. <laughs> I'll tell you something. My ex-girlfriend was a succubus. <laughs> oh, sorry. I forgot we were going back to that. Yep. She, but I don't know. I she's just a, think she, she couldn't get enough of me. She's a zombie succulent. 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 You know, succulent. all of the zombies wanted me. Because, look. I mean, look at me. Mm-hmm, you got it all. And now, I, and I didn't even have the money back then. You're so fuzzy. How can you resist? Yeah, they call me a bear. <laughs> oh, God. Should we move on to the next? Go on. I love listening to your beautiful, sweet boy- voice, Rebecca. I'd like to acknowledge finding Reddit true Halloween stories was way harder than I thought it was going to be. It's very hard. So a lot of these are like scary real life things. Well, that's the serious stuff, though. The real life. That's still horror. Yeah. My next one is more Halloween-y. This one is <laughs> scary. This one, have I think I watched it with you when we were in high school. Do you remember the movie, was it High? No, Hush? Where she's deaf? Yes. Oh my god, yes. Kind of reminds me of it. It's not really like it at all, but it reminds me of it for some reason. Well, at least whenever I read the story and was imagining it, it was that house. Which is like basically a glass house in the middle of the the woods and it's like modern and it's really pretty. That movie's scary. Super scary. You should watch it. Hush. Imagine that house though, to add a little spice. He pretended to be my dog. So he's a furry. (laughs) Maybe. Before I start, there's a bit of context to my story. My husband and I lived in a small two-floor house with two main entrances, one along the front and along the side of the house, which opens up into the laundry room. When we're too busy or it's too late to walk our dog, we hook his collar onto a long line that's attached to one of the pipes in the corner of the house so he can use the bathroom. We used to do this from the door in our laundry room, but we'd noticed the large step from the door to the ground had been taking a toll on his hips. As a result, we started letting him out through the front door instead since the porch is much closer to the ground. This particular night, I was home alone with my dog and it was around midnight when I decided to let him outside one last time before going to bed. I hook him up to his line, close the door and lock it before heading into the kitchen to put away the dishes. 
This was pretty routine. Even if he used the bathroom quick, quickly, he liked to walk around along the front and side of the house for a few minutes before coming back inside. As I'm putting away the dishes, I hear a scratch on the door. How my dog signals he wants to come inside, so I head over to let him back in. Since I've watched way too many scary movies, I always look through the door peephole before opening it. Out of habit, I look to check that my dog is at the front front door. Instead, I see a man staring very intently at the door handle. I freeze with my hand on the door handle. I don't know how much time went by, but then I heard another scratch, this one louder than the last. This kind of wakes me up in my initial shock, and I run to grab my cell phone. I call my husband to tell him what's happening. He was very confused. I probably wasn't explaining the situation very well, but says he's heading home. This is when I realize my dog is still outside with this person. I head back to the front door, trying to make as little noise as possible to check whether the stranger is still there. Just like before, he's standing there, head bowed, looking at the door. I tiptoe over to the laundry room and slowly open the door as quietly as possible. I can't see my dog anywhere in the, at the side of the house, and it's covered in gravel. I knew I couldn't step outside without making a noise. With my heart still pounding in my chest, I go to the front door to keep an eye on the stranger and to get a better look at him. I considered calling the police, but I didn't feel they would take me seriously since all this man was doing was standing in front of my house. I tried taking a picture of him with my cell phone, but my camera was only able to take pictures of the people and not the images behind the glass. All of a sudden, the man looks up directly at me. I swear he knew I was there. He glares at me, then opens his mouth to show his taunting, malicious grin. He stood there that way for a few seconds. With, with that, he turns around and starts to walk down the street. I stay in the same place, almost expecting him to rush back and start pounding on the door. My husband got back after a few minutes. Long story short, he convinced me to call the police, and when it, we went outside to look for my dog. It turns out this man had cut the end of the line connected to the pipe, and our dog decided this was a good time for him to explore my neighbor's backyard, which was where we found him. It's been three years since this happened. We've been, we've since moved to a new house and the police weren't able to come up with any suspects ever since we take our dog on very long walks before the sun goes down first of all that would be the best story for a ring ad <laughs> true that is seriously that just irked me to my bones that was so freaky ew and the smile but yeah i just imagined the hush house and like i guess i was like imagining worst case scenarios and freak myself out but i can't believe she called her husband before she called the police yeah, the police would, a man is on yeah like, like they, they're gonna come all you have to even if you're like the police aren't gonna come or like believe me or understand me literally be like there's someone trying to break into my house like yeah. even if he's not like he's trying to get inside your house he had a knife i don't know why he would oh he had a knife well he cut the the oh, leash right. of the dog i don't know why yeah. Why would you do that? What's the point of that? Bro, furries are getting out of hand. <laughs> okay. He wanted to be her dog. You guys, listen, I totally support the furry community, but, like, you can't be trying to, like, impersonate people's animals and get to their house, because that's just wrong. I would move immediately. Like, I don't think I could sleep there that night. I'm so serious. Uh-oh. Oh, God, that was a creepy one. I was worried about the dog the whole time. I thought she was going to find the dog, like... Yeah, I was thinking about the dog, too. You gotta get the doggy. So this is this is a shorter one, but this is a two-parter. I was working as a bartender at a hotel that a flight attendant was murdered in, room 354. It was close to closing time when the manager on duty, a very small woman, comes into the bar and tells me she needed my help. It seems the fire panel is showing an alarm in room 354, which had been somewhat cleaned and left vacant since the murder. So the two of us go up to the elevator and start heading down the long L-shaped corridor. As we round the corner, we can see papers have been shoved under the door from the inside of the room with help me written on them. So the manager puts her master key in the lock and opens the door to the pitch black room and we hear, thank God you finally come. We both instinctively jump back and then see one of our maintenance workers stroll out of the door. It seems maintenance has been using the room for storage and once he went inside, the doorknob was broken off on the inside. There were no lights or phone in the room, so he held his lighter up to the fire alarm. And then it says, for more information on the murder and killer, Google search Nancy Ludwig. So I searched it, and this is her story, the person that got murdered in that room. In February 17th, 1991, it was like any other workday for Northwest Airlines flight attendant Nancy Ludwig. She arrived at Detroit Metro Airport in the evening after working a flight from Las Vegas, along with other crew members. 
She took a shuttle from the airport to the Hilton Airport Inn. When they were seen the night at a little after 9 p.m., Nancy took the elevator to the third floor, walked down the long hallway into her room, number 354. The next morning, a housekeeper bypassed her room due to a do not disturb sign hung on the door. Later that day, after she would have checked out, the housekeeper opened the door and found Nancy lying dead on the carpet in a pool of blood. The television was on, tuned to CNN's coverage of the Persian Gulf War. She had been R-worded before having her throat cut. Unfortunately, police had little evidence to work with in the DNA area. The perpetrator had removed everything from the room that could potentially identify him. After reviewing the crime scene, police surmised the killer had followed Nancy to her room and then forced his way in after she unlocked the door. The case remained unsolved for years, greatly frustrating Nancy's family who did their best to keep the case in the news and the investigation active. However, in 2001, Jeffrey Wayne Gorton was arrested in 1986 for R-word and murder of Margaret Ebby Pro Provost. We were able to identify him through a fingerprint left at the crime scene. Police were able to use the DNA to link the two cases, and with a suspect in hand, police found additional evidence linking Gordon to Nancy's murder. Gordon was found guilty in both cases and received 40 to 80 year sentence as well as a life sentence. Good. Boom, boom, eat that little, little bitch. Get arrested. It's so weird, like, that there's not, um, a life sentence is a life sentence and then they add on, like, 80 years. I love it when they do that because it's like, you are never yeah. Like, <laughs> never in your never. next lifetime you are going to be here so like you are Literally. stuck here when you get sentenced to 200 years i can't imagine being the maintenance man going into that room knowing someone was murdered in there the door closing behind me and the doorknob falling off like excuse me i, I wonder so if like the murderer did something with the doorknob or something <gasps> If, if they have i mean they used it for storage bro so that was such a good theory like the murderer did something to the doorknob and then it's still broken when was the murder and when was the story the murder happened in 1991 and the story is a year after the incident all right this is our last story our last two we each have one more oh yeah i was like yeah okay this one is called my daughter's imaginary friend <gasps> In 2013, my wife and I divorced and we both moved into separate homes. The divorce went well and we are still good friends to this day, partly because we have a daughter together. We agreed to split custody over our daughter and I rented an old house in a historic district in the city where we live. I was in a very pretty home built in 1935, kept up very well. I would have my daughter two weeks at a time and she had a bedroom in the back. She was three years old at the time and I kept noticing her talking to her friend. One day, I found her in a little closet talking to someone and I remembered her saying she was talking to another little girl named Betty. <laughs> I have no idea where she heard the name Betty as she was only three years old, but I just chalked it all up to a child's vivid imagination. Keep in mind, I am a single dad to a little girl. I really have no idea what I'm doing when it comes to dressing, hair, or just little girl stuff in general. Her mom is good at that stuff, but not me. I put my daughter to bed one night after her bath. I remember brushing her hair that night, but that was all I did. That morning, her mom came to pick her up from my house and my daughter was just waking up. Her mom went back to the bedroom to find my daughter's hair was fixed in two perfect French braids. What the hell? <laughs> Her mom was real proud of me at first that I had done her hair so cute, but I told her I didn't and I couldn't have done that. I can't even braid her hair, much less do perfect French braids. We asked our daughter how her hair got fixed and she told us that Betty had done it during the night. I broke the contract on the rental agreement and I moved out within that month. Hell no. Could you fucking imagine? I would be like, send her back and she's summoning some. Because she... Betty is stuck to her now. Like... If my kid has an imaginary friend, I'm going to say I am going to murder them. <laughs> like, I literally, I literally am like, your friend is dead. You like, can't say that. I'm going to be like, where's your friend sitting? And they're like, in that chair. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, she's dead now, so stop talking about her. <laughs> Even, like, my cats and, like, my dogs when they are randomly like, yes, that is one of the scariest things ever. When they're just staring at something and I'm like, like there's nothing something. there. Okay, they could have, maybe they like, I always think maybe they hear a car or something, but. God, I hope so. Have you, did you ever have an imaginary friend? I don't think so. I peed one time when, well, I slept walked and peed in the basement one time. You were possessed? Yeah, I slept walked too once and my mom was decorating for Christmas and she had all of her 
glass ornaments on the ground. Aww. All of her Christmas decorations were just like unboxed and scattered everywhere, but she went to bed. And in my sleep, I tiptoed in between these ornaments and I didn't break any of them. Damn. And like, I woke up in the basement. My mom couldn't find me. That is seriously impressive. Weird. That was the only time I remember sleepwalking. Your daughter just wakes up with two French braids. Dude, literally. I would be searching the house. Oh God, I'd be, I would be sick scared. Like I feel yeah. sick right now. That's so scary. Like if Cooper woke up with two French braids in his <laughs> hair and I was like, honey, why'd you French braid Cooper's hair? He's getting shaved. This is the story of Bloody Mary. If you think you know what happened to her, you don't until you hear the story. So keep listening. She lived in the forest in a tiny cottage and sold herbal remedies for a living. Folks living in the town nearby called her Bloody Mary and said she was a witch. None dared cross the old crone for fear that their cows would go dry. Their food stores rot away before winter. Their children take sick of fever or any number of terrible things that an angry witch could do to her neighbors. Then the little girls in the village began to disappear, one by one. No one could find out where they had gone. Grief-stricken families searched the woods, the local buildings, and all of the houses and barns, but there was no sign of the missing girls. A few brave souls even went to Bloody Mary's home in the woods to see if the witch had taken the girls, but she denied any knowledge of the disappearances. Still, it was noted that her haggard appearance had changed. She looked younger, more attractive. The neighbors were suspicious, but they could find no proof that the witch had taken their young ones. Then came the night when the daughter of the miller rose from her bed and walked outside, following an enchanted sound no one else could hear. The miller's wife had a toothache and was sitting up in the kitchen treating the tooth with an herbal remedy, when her daughter left the house. She screamed for her husband and followed the girl out of the door. The miller came running in his nightshirt. Together, they tried to restrain the girl, but she kept breaking away from them and heading out of town. The desperate cries of the miller and his wife woke the neighbors. They came to assist the frantic couple. Suddenly, a sharp-eyed farmer gave a shout and pointed towards a strange light at the edge of the woods. A few townsmen followed him out of the field and saw Bloody Mary standing beside a large oak tree, holding a magic wand that was pointed towards the miller's house. She was glowing with an unearthly light as she set her evil spell upon the miller's daughter. The townsmen grabbed their guns and their pitchforks and ran towards the witch. When she heard the commotion, Bloody Mary broke off her spell and fled back into the woods. The far-sighted farmer had a loaded gun with silver bullets in case the witch ever came after his daughter. Now he took aim and shot at her. The bullet hit Bloody Mary in the hip and she fell to the ground. The angry townsmen leapt upon her and carried her into a field where they built a huge bonfire and burned her at the stake. As she burned, Bloody Mary screamed a curse at the villagers. If anyone mentioned her name aloud before a mirror, she would send her spirit to revenge herself upon them for her terrible death. When she was dead, the villagers went to the house in the wood and found the unmarked grave of the little girls the witch had murdered. She had used their blood to make her young again. From that day on, anyone foolish enough to chant Bloody Mary's name three times before a darkened mirror will summon the vengeful spirit of the witch. It is said that she will tear their bodies to pieces and rip their souls from their mutilated bodies. The souls of these unfortunate ones will be burned in torment as Bloody Mary once was burned, and they will be trapped forever in the mirror. Dun, dun, dun! But I'll protect you. Have you ever done that when you were little? No. You didn't. Did you know about it? Yes, but I knew damn better you than to do that better. i did it you did it or didn't i did it oh my lord That's have mercy so, this is real like i was fucking terrified of bloody mary and i didn't know the backstory but it stemmed from when i was little my friend had a, had a halloween party and we were doing all the little legends and all that stuff freaking it freaking each other out and then we turned off all the lights stood in the mirror there's like five girls in there. Did the Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, you know. <laughs> you I can't believe you just mumbled that in my presence. 
You were lucky there's not a mirror. And then when we turned the lights back on, my friend's mom was sitting there like... And uh, like she had some some dark thing over her head, and oh my god, one of one of the girls in there dropped to the ground, lost feeling in her legs. Oh like my god. I had like the, <laughs> the like the, <laughs> that kind of scream. <laughs> Bro, that is so fucked up. And ever since that, I like had been terrified of her, and then I wanted to get over it. So in middle school, I tried to do it by myself in the bathroom. Freaked myself out, couldn't look at myself in the mirror, I thought I was seeing things, you know. And then it turned into, like, a f- every time I was in the bathroom, fear. Oh, so, no. Dude, you're brave as fuck for doing that alone. I would, this doesn't make sense, but I would try to get it out of the bathroom by the time, you know how when the toilet flushes, it has a sound? Yeah. By the time that sound stopped i needed to be out of there wow or she was gonna appear that's an ocd thing too like i have some tendencies to be like if i don't touch this three times i'm my whole family's gonna die yeah like Like, it made no sense but i I, she was gonna come as soon as the toilet stopped running did you ever participate in an ouija board yes you are crazy that one scared the shit out of me too it was middle school we found a ouija board at my friend's grandparents house they had their whole back of the house was glass. The grandparents told us not to do it, but we did it. They had it. Yeah, what the hell? And um, so we're all doing it. I'm kind of getting scared. I was always told not to do those things. And then just bang, 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 bang oh, on the glass God, door. Dude. It was the grandpa. You are insane for doing that. That scared the shit out of me. Seriously. That one, I think I peed. I think I, I pee peed. I would never. Seriously. I'm not someone that is interested in demons at all. Like, I would never do that stuff. I want to do it just for the, like, bad energy. Even if it's nothing actually happens, right. you still have that anxiety. And then, net, then from that point on, every little sound you hear, you're going to be like... <gasps> like, I already sometimes think I'm, like, getting... One, listen, one time I was at this antique shop, and as I'm walking by, this thing just fell. And I was like, okay, I that am possessed. I, so ever since then, I've been on edge. That's a sign. Yeah, it was very creepy. Always had this fear that, like... When I buy something at an antique stop shop, there's gonna there could be possibly a, a spirit attached to it, like yeah. Annabelle. Or uh, have you seen the possession? No. It's like a box that she bought at the antique store. Oh. There's so many stories like that. Like you go to a garage sale or antique store and the doll you take home. Yeah. Those Annabelle stories are scary. I actually really like scary movies because I love the, the just the story itself, like the yeah. conspiracy of it. It's so fascinating. Yeah. But then there's some, like this one movie, The Deliverance. It's out on Netflix. Yes, I just watched that. Okay, how was yeah. it? I liked it, but it got super evangelical. Oh, like how so? Like she starts speaking in tongues and it's all of like a person who does an exorcist. Exorcism is an exorcist, usually Catholic, but a deliverer, I think. A deliverer is an evangelical okay, exorcist. Okay, okay. She like starts speaking in tongues and it's kind of like getting closer to God. They lost me at the end there, okay. but the lead up oh it was scary well, i hate to tell you this but i guess you do a ouija board stuff so you won't you don't care but the reason i didn't watch the movies was because i looked it up oh what's it on and i saw this thing talking about how they actually summoned and used like a real demon on set in the movie so i got too scared to watch it because who knows That's some good publicity yeah. isn't it ah, okay could have been <laughs> all right no but i've always thought about that like um with filming horror movies they definitely are freaking themselves the fuck out they're all like the energy joey king in that one movie she got a rare blood disease on set that the conjuring yeah and she's never experienced anything else after getting off set it, and she think like they literally think she was possessed or something the, the actual house too yeah. i know i've heard i've heard the conjuring stuff was real i've heard that if you watch the conjuring it's the you know it's gonna happen to you whatever oh my god shit well i've watched it fuck honestly uh. it's like it's the fear energy it's i think that's what happened one time i give in and watch a scary movie <laughs> and it's the one that's gonna affect you the one the one out of all of them <laughs> I want to go and watch a scary movie. I do too, actually. I'm serious. Thank you guys for watching. I hope we didn't scare you too much. Just kidding. I hope you peed your pants because you were so scared. Yeah, that's the goal. Happy Halloween. And make sure to... Make sure to 
Um, not use Ouija boards. Not use Ouija boards. No. Uh, don't go out the front. Go out the window. Um, if you see somebody in your house, pretend like you didn't. And sneak. Um, don't let your child get French braided by a ghost. Absolutely. Us, no. Don't let, don't let your kid have a murderer friend, okay? <laughs> like, just don't let them have that. Don't say Bloody Mary three times in a dark mirror. No. And just don't be mean. Yeah, just be nice. If you see a ghost, it's a hey. It's just lonely. Yeah. Lonely. Aren't we all a little lonely sometimes? Yeah. Have some grace. Exactly. <laughs> And happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Bye.